All right. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today. Nancy Fry is a professor in educational leadership at San Diego State University and a leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. She has been a special education teacher, reading specialist, and administrator in public schools. Nancy has engaged in professional learning communities as a member and in designing school-wide systems to improve teaching and learning for all students. She's published numerous books, including the Success Criteria Playbook and Comprehension, the Skill, Will, and Thrill of Reading. Thank you, Nancy, for being with us today. And next I have John Almerode. John has worked with hundreds of school districts and thousands of teachers. In addition to his time in pre-K-12 schools and classrooms, he's an associate professor and executive director of teaching and learning in the College of Education at James Madison University, where he works with pre-service teachers and pursues his research interests. John and his colleagues have presented their work to the United States Congress and the United States Department of Education, as well as to the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. He has authored multiple articles, reports, book chapters, and more than a dozen books on effective teaching and learning in today's schools and classrooms. Thanks, John, for being with us. And I will now turn it over to you to kick us off. All right. Hey, Nancy, I have to tell you, um, the chat box is incredibly nice to us. Um, I don't know if you've noticed it. It, it, it. So thank you. And I don't know if you wanted to respond, Nancy, but I have to tell you, thank you so much to all of you in the chat box. Yes, I've been answering people as well. Thank you so much. What a wonderful way to kick off 2023. So appreciate your time uh, during this very busy day, time of your day or evening. Absolutely. So Nancy, um, you and I get to tackle uh, this evening or for some of you this morning, uh, scaffolding. Um, and I don't know about uh, about you, but scaffolding has always been on the forefront of my mind in classrooms. Now, I may have called it something different, um, but in, in my desire and likely your desire as well, to ensure that everyone has equitable access and opportunity to the highest level of learning possible, how do we support learners um, so that they can reach those milestones, reach those goals, and, and reach those outcomes. Um, in mathematics and science, which is where I spent uh, almost all of my career, uh, this reared its head in, in the basics of mathematics, but also in concepts of science, especially chemistry and physics. Um, I, I don't know what your experience is, but I'm pretty sure that we share a common uh, thought on that. So let's dive into this. Uh, we want to ask you to do something for us, and it may seem a little uh, out in left field, but you're going to need something to write with and write on for just a moment. Um, I just want you to jot down uh, some information for us. Uh, if you're driving or if you're in a football stadium or if you're in horrible weather, don't follow this next set of instructions. But if you can, I need you to jot down something for us. Um, and that is, what is it? you would do to teach someone to ride a bike. Now, I know it says put that in the chat box, but I want you to kind of sketch that out on your own first before you place it in that chat box. Um, so on your own, on, on some scrap paper, how do you teach someone to ride a bike? I'll give you a couple of minutes to think through that, and then I'm going to ask you to put some ideas in the chat box. But for now, think on your own. I'll give you about two minutes, uh, and then Nancy and I have something we want to do with that set of instructions. How do you teach someone to ride a bike? Take about two minutes on your own. Take another 30 seconds or so and then start to put these things into the chat box.
I love it. These answers are fantastic. I, so I want you to hang on to those answers. Keep putting them in the chat box uh, by all means, but I, I want to break down the responses. Uh, one of the things Nancy and I want you to think about is what is the difference between um, riding a bicycle and, and balancing equations? Uh, what's the difference between teaching someone to ride a bike versus teaching someone to read? Uh, what about riding a bike and teaching someone about main idea or riding a bike and, and having students engage in a laboratory or a problem solving task? The argument we want to throw out there this evening or this morning, depending on where you are in the world, is that these two requests may not be as different as they appear on the surface. L let me show you what we're talking about. If you look at that list, the things that you either put in the chat box or that you have written down in front of you, I, I want you to check for certain things in that list. Uh, maybe somewhere on your list, uh, again, either in the chat box or on your paper, did you articulate that you needed to right size the task? In other words, maybe you had to break it down so that a learner could get access to it, a smaller bike, um, a bike that had a, a set of steps to it that they could get to and get onto the bike. Um, did you right size your task? Take a look there. Are there examples of where you right sized the task? Uh, second thing we want you to look for is the safe experience. Uh, did you provide safety? Someone mentioned that they would go in their backyard and practice on the grass. Um, that's really smart. Somebody said you would get behind them and push them once they get comfortable and let them go. That's That may have worked for you, and I certainly don't want to discount your own bike riding experiences, but that may not be uh, this type of safe experience we're talking about. But a helmet, a knee pads, uh, practicing on the grass, uh, handling the tricky parts. Uh, maybe you held the bike for the learner to get onto that bike. So you handled that part and maybe you removed the opportunity to go up a hill or down a hill or around a curve and simply maintained a flat surface. And so you took care of the tricky parts or removed those tricky parts. And then finally, did you provide encouragement or would you have provided encouragement? It turns out these four ideas, the four ideas you see on the screen right now are the foundations for scaffolding anything, whether riding a bike or reading a book. It, these are the four foundational pieces to scaffolding. And so we want to dive into these and talk about what this might look like as we implement it in our classrooms. And so that's exactly what our learning intention is for this evening uh, or this morning, this webinar. We're learning about scaffolding. And the whole idea is that we can better support our learners to quite simply do hard things. We want our learners to do hard things. We want them to engage in challenging learning. Uh, we want to en engage them in the highest level of complex learning possible. And so that's our learning intention. Why would we wanna spend so much time on this? Why is this worth the conversation? Two reasons. Number one, we've all faced situations where we weren't sure how to scaffold a learner and support them in a way that led them to long-term success. We've all been in situations and maybe by a show of hands with your emotional reactions, we've been in situations where we probably enabled the learner or we probably gave them the answer uh, with good intentions when we really wanted to scaffold them so that they could do it again on their own. I, I know that's me for sure. Um, when we do this, correctly. And when I say correctly, that is a relative term and certainly very subjective. Um, but the effect size for scaffolding is 0.58. Uh, so it, it certainly ramps up learning. You certainly see the rate of learning exceed one year's worth of growth. And so it seems worthy of our attention to ensure that we don't do some of those other things that actually have negative effect sizes. And we're going to get into that shortly. Uh, when we're finished, when we start to wind down our time together, these are our three success criteria. I'll give you a chance to take a look. And because these animated uh, reactions are so cool and my new Zoom update allows me to see them, uh, let's try it again. Um, with your emotional reactions, give me a thumbs up if you'd be interested in picking up three or four, maybe even five and six ideas that would help you scaffold learning tomorrow in your classroom. If that's you, hit that emotional reaction button. <laughs> Excellent. So let's get started. I want to share with you several big ideas that are going to guide this conversation. In fact, four big ideas around scaffolding. Here comes the first one. Number one, 
Scaffolding is only used when the task at hand is not possible to complete without support. Um, so this is one of the ways that we can avoid or sidestep the potential to enable or uh, build a, a culture of learned helplessness. Um, there's a difference between um, not possible to do without support and I don't want to do this. The don't want to actually speaks to engagement. Uh, and that's certainly a different conversation for a different webinar. But what this conversation is about in this webinar is, is it possible for students to do it without support? If the answer is yes, then scaffolding is not the answer. There's something else. Um, but if they can't do it without support yet, can't do it yet, then scaffolding is, is the way to go. Here, here's something that happens. Teacher student support has a, has a relatively high effect size. And you're going to see another version of this in just a few seconds. But as long as it's supportive and not enabling. So big idea number one, scaffolding should only be pulled onto when it's not possible without support or they can't do it yet. Now, what Nancy's going to talk to us about later on in our time together is that we want to get to a point where we, when we pull that scaffolding back, they can continue to do it. But that's another conversation. Big idea number two. If we're looking for one way to scaffold for everybody, that's probably not going to happen. The research on this has been pretty clear. We've had a good time digging through this research over the past uh, six months. The customization of scaffolding is really important. What works for one student doesn't necessarily work for another. And they could be sitting next to each other, which means when we put scaffolds in place, it's better if the task or the learning experience that we have created for them gives us room for scaffolding. Let me give you an example in non-example. Tasks that are easy to scaffold are those tasks that give students choice, uh, that allow them to personally respond, um, that, that are authentic in nature. Tasks that are very difficult to scaffold are those tasks that have one outcome, one pathway. So one of the things to think about as we move forward is if scaffolding is to be customized, how do I make this sustainable on, on me as a teacher with 30 students in my classroom? One of the things that we can do is look at the specific learning task that we've developed for the day's learning and find out, does it have the flexibility to be scaffolded or have we designed a learning task that has one pathway, one outcome, one result. In that case, in that case, we may have a learning task challenge, not necessarily a scaffolding challenge, but it does have to be customized because in the end, we want to make sure that we find that right level of challenge. So scaffolding is very important to us because we're looking for that Goldilocks principle. The idea that it can't be too hard, it can't be too easy, it must be just right. And so the idea is, thank you, Carrie. Uh, and so it must be just right. It's often referred to as the Goldilocks principle. Uh, now, Nancy, I don't know if you if 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 you remember conversations we've had on the Goldilocks principle that was stolen from um, astronomy. Uh, astrophysicists found that there's a certain area uh, away from a star that allows a planet to be habitable, and it's called the Goldilocks zone. Uh, and we're looking for the same thing in our classrooms. So big idea number two is that scaffolding must be customized. Um, so let's review very quickly. In the chat box, I need you to write down uh, the word, the words not possible. So type in not possible, please, in the chat box. And then follow that up with the word yet. The word yet. So switch to yet. That's important, right? The next thing, we're going to try to break the chat room. That's my goal. Uh, the next idea is customized. So if you would type in customized. And here comes the next big idea. I think I did just break the chat. Okay, there we go. The next big idea. Uh, scaffolds are temporary and not permanent. Uh, I want you to think for a minute the scaffolds on a building. Uh, if your school has been renovated, if you live, um, I've seen some folks report that they're from Chicago and, 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 and LA and they're from uh, Dallas. So when you look at these big buildings, when the scaffolding is put up, does the scaffolding stay up? So when the building's done, do we just leave the scaffolding up? The answer is no, of course not. We don't. And so scaffolds are temporary, not permanent. I'm going to show you an effect size that likely will rattle us. It rattled me. Uh, Nancy, it, this, this effect size just absolutely blew my mind. 
What happens if we don't recognize this third big idea? Uh, look at the effect size for teacher-student dependency. Negative 0.24. Teacher-student dependency comes from scaffolds that are left up permanently. And now, Siobhan, I saw your comment about New York City. And yes, it may feel like in New York City, the scaffolds do stay up forever. Um, but I assure you uh, that they don't, even if it feels that way. So temporary, not permanent. The other thing that can happen is that you can have frustration uh, if the scaffold is left up too long or if there's not enough scaffolding, um, the right scaffolding, wrong time, wrong scaffolding, that sort of thing. And so we can have frustration. Here's the last one. This is big, 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 because oftentimes we may make the mistake of putting a task or learning experience in front of a student and they not feel like they will ever get there regardless of the scaffolds that are provided. And so this one is important and, and that there must be a visible solution that the learner recognizes. They must recognize I can do this even with this support. And that support is temporary and not permanent. So there must be a visible solution to the problem. The learner must feel that they can get there. It must be viable and it must be visible. So you're right, um, uh, Lois, the scaffold has to set the student up for success. So we're going to talk about how this happens here in just a second, but I want to show you the value of this. When they feel like there's a viable way to get to a solution, this starts to fuel their self-efficacy, which has an effect size of 0.67. So let's talk about how scaffolding happens. Um, I'm gonna show you a model for scaffolding uh, that has come from a recent research paper. And I'm just gonna let you take it in. Take about a minute or so and just kind of look at that. Now, one of the things we want you to zero in on is just take a look at that and just what stands out to you. Just take, just put it in the chat box. What do you see? Excellent. And, and and these are great responses. So this mo this is a, a conceptual model of, of what fading looks like. And some of you have already asked this in the chat, and we're going to go right to that next. We're going to start to transition next um, to what does this look like in our classrooms, right? Because this model in and of itself doesn't tell me what I'm going to do on Tuesday. Um, it does give me a general idea that scaffolding is an interaction between student and instructor. We know that. We're good with that. Um, and that there should be instructor fading. That's the remove. But and that requires the student to gain responsibility where I want you to zero in. And this is super important. This is so cool. That checkered box in the middle that says contingency, that says contingency, that's the happening area because that right there is where we're going to spend the rest of our time together in this webinar and is really the focus of the work that we've been up to the past several months uh, and even beyond that in, in, in our own classrooms and that you likely have been up to. That contingency. What is a contingency? And this is so cool. I love this. This gets me so excited. So if you're not as excited as I am about this, if you'll just pretend for a minute um, and then eventually I will go away. So contingency, Conting a contingency clause just says, if this, then this, um, if that, then this, right? If you do this, th there's certain things that will happen as a result of that. A, a backup plan would be a contingency, um, but a contingency plan is if certain things happen, then I have other outcomes that, that will go in there. That box, that contingency, um, is where we want to really figure out what that looks like in our classroom. For example, if my students run into unproductive struggle here, do I have a contingency in place? That's a scaffold. If my students are doing something and I see that they are ready for me to move things away, 
then there's the contingency. What if they understand this? What if they get this? What if, what if, what if? And so that's where we developed a different model or a new model for thinking about scaffolding that helps us sort out these contingencies. What are those contingencies? What do those contingencies require of us as teachers? And that's where we're going to go now. Um, before I do, I, I, I want to take a moment and let you process this. Um, what is it that's jumped out at you already? Um, and, and what has grabbed your attention so far in our time together? Anna, ah, great contingency. Yep. Customized. Excellent. Thank you, Victoria. The effect sizes, yeah. Ah, uh, Alex uh, Alexandria, yeah, they do not have to stay up there because they should be customized and they should be temporary. Fading, yep, not permanent. I know I love the ideas. Always looking for feedback, absolutely. Ah, Kelly, effective contingencies require clarity. Whew. Well, we can't get away from that clarity concept. It's foundational for everything. The Goldilocks principle. Yeah, scaffolding is not a regular activity per se, but when the task is not possible, right, right. So are you ready to see the model that we've put together? And this is the model that we use in our own classrooms, uh, and we have worked with teachers uh, to develop and fuel this model. So I want to walk you through each part of the model uh, alongside Nancy, and we're going to walk through all the different things that have to be there in order for that scaffold to work, in order for that scaffold to work. And it's going to require some drawing. So if you've got something to write with and write on next to you, I want you to draw this out with us. Uh, it'll be fun, I promise. So step one, scaffolding, or the first part of that model is that Oddly enough, we have to have a mental model. Now, in order to scaffold, um, we have to have the end in mind, but not the end in mind in terms of learning intentions and success criteria. While those are important, when we say mental model, what are all the different pieces and parts uh, that have to be in place in the finished product, the finished process, the overall outcome, because then that helps us make important decisions about where scaffolds have to be and where they don't have to be. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say we're going to look, let's say we're looking at several learning intentions. I'm, I'm going to put a couple up. And you can decide which one you want to zero in on, but I'm going to zero in on the world history one for just a moment. So let's say and that today we're learning about the context surrounding the rise and fall of empires. Um, and so I have to have a mental model about the final outcome of this particular. What, was a, what would a student do? What would a student say? How would a student act? And I need to map that out in the form of a mental model. The reason I need to do that is because once I have my mental model in mind, the essential characteristics are where I'm going to direct my attention and make decisions about whether to scaffold it or not scaffold it. But things that aren't necessarily important, that's where I can give student choice and have the student make some decisions and invest in that decision making. So for example, let's say I'm having them write an essay. Um, and, and the essay is articulating why empires rise or empires fall. If writing it in a clear, concise, and well-supported essay is the essential product and all those characteristics, then that's where my scaffolds are going to go. But if it really doesn't matter whether they type it, whether they write it, and which empire they use, then that allows me to give some student choice to them to get them to invest and to recruit them into the learning so that the scaffolds have a higher potential for working. So what are some ways that we can share the mental model with our students? Well, one of the things we can do is literally model it. Um, if this is what it means to do this thing or engage in this task, then we model it. Model it for them. 
The second thing that we can do is provide exemplars. Um, I was just recently in Georgia working with schools and, and a teacher shared with me that they often will analyze exemplars um, before diving in so that students can see what has to be there and then what doesn't necessarily have to be there. And this is really cool. I'd never thought about this. She emphasizes the differences in the papers that are treated as exemplars. So what did this student do differently than that student, but they still have exemplary work? Well, they chose to talk about this or they chose to do this. And it's usually, that's right. You get, you get to make those decisions. So where we put our scaffolds depends on the mental model because the mental model of success and what are the essential characteristics of that process, product, or outcome tell me where I'm going to need to provide that support. So let's go to the second part of this. Once we have a mental model, and we've, start to, we've started to identify where scaffolds need to be put in place. Now we have to work alongside learners to start to set goals. So what is it that causes them to engage in struggle? And these, these goal setting exercises, this goal setting process will ensure that that struggle stays productive and doesn't become unproductive or that they don't shift into unproductive failure. We want to make sure we stay in that productive struggle, productive failure zone. And one of the ways to do that is to engage in goal setting so that we're working alongside and collaborating with our learners. And so let's say we talk about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And that's what that learner has selected. Or let's say we're talking about the rise and fall of empires in general. And so we have a group of students that, that are going to need some additional scaffolding. We want to make sure we set aside time to then goal set with those learners or have, them learn, have those learners set goals for themselves as they work through it so that we know when to put those scaffolds in, when to pull those scaffolds back, when to wait on a scaffold. And, and we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. But the goal setting is key. So lots of different ways to goal set. First and foremost, we want to make sure that we let the learners have an opportunity to use an initial assessment or to engage in an initial assessment, right, and figure out where they have strengths and where they have opportunities. What is it in that initial assessment that this student demonstrated high levels of proficiency and high strengths in doing? That data I need, but it's important for the student to recognize that, not just us as the teacher. So maybe we have them do an error analysis or we have them do an analysis um, of their performance on an initial assessment. And then we want to zero in on those opportunities for growth. That's huge. Where is it that you recognized maybe there were things that were challenging that we got wrong, things that were easy that we got wrong, things that you recognize, I don't know. Something's going on here. I, I struggle with this. And having the learner converse about that, because then that helps them decide what their next steps are, what their next steps are. And then we start to build in how we can support it. Once we have learners engage in error analysis, we engage in that conference. Now we're ready to start mapping out what to do next. So the goal action plan. Now, using all of this part of this, however you choose to use this, uh, for example, I have a school division that I get to hang out with on a regular basis, um, and they do this on Google Docs. And so students go in on their pre-assessments, they take their success criteria, and they either sort them in strengths or opportunities, and then they talk about where they need to practice and spend some more time. Uh, in Dallas, Texas, uh, they do the same thing with the analysis, and they then decide which groups they go into to get some more practice. In those groups, that's where the scaffolding is provided. So once we have these conferences with students and it becomes part of our norms, then guess what? Students start to naturally do this. Uh, my daughter uh, took a social studies test, and things didn't go so well on that social studies test. And she, without hesitation, said, well, these questions here I need to spend more time on. So tomorrow during uh, content block, this is what I'm going to do. Jackson, using IXL Mathematics, did the same thing with one of his assessments. He said, I need additional support here. And so during uh, IXL small group math time, this is where I'm going to go in my learning. Last, but certainly not least, 
uh, with goal setting is then the goal setting tracking sheet. Uh, this can take different forms. What you see on the screen is just a mere example of how to do goal setting or tracking. Uh, some folks use the learning pit. Uh, some folks use uh, clothesline clips uh, or clothing clips that, that they move up and down based on their learning progressions. There are lots of different ways. But the message here is that we have to have a mental model and we have to engage students in goal setting around those scaffolds so we can build those scaffolds in place to get them to that mental model. If we think about the mental model as a blueprint, as a blueprint, that helps us know where we put the scaffold because that's the part of the building on, we're working on next. And so I want to take just a moment, because this is a lot in a very short amount of time, and give you a chance to, to in the chat box, talk about how you work with mental models and how you use goal setting already in your classroom, because we don't pretend to think um, that this isn't happening in your classrooms on a regular basis. We're just trying to put a label on it and a name on it so that we can use it intentionally and purposefully to scaffold learning. So in the chat box, how do you do this? Excellent. Yep. These will this this these will be available. Yep. Absolutely. Exit tickets. Yeah. Data binders, graphic organizers, exit tickets, smiley faces to track in math. Yep. Shared OneDrive folders. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Excellent. Mentimeters, love it. Love it. But we can't stop here, right, Nancy? So we've got goal setting, and that comes from our mental models. But now the fun starts, because the goal setting should lead us into what? Well, I think Nancy's muted. Sorry about that. Can Are you able to see my slide? just want to make sure... Are we good? We're Excellent. good, yes. Excellent. Okay, so uh, John, uh, thank you so much for really setting the stage for this. I, I think that um, what can happen, and, and both of us work with novice teachers as part of the work that we do, is that when they think about scaffolding, they go immediately to this green part, right? What are the different ways I can scaffold without necessarily understanding that scaffolding requires first and foremost, a mental model, a blueprint. We'll keep doing those construction analogies. I love that idea of a blueprint. Uh, a learner needs to know what this is supposed to look like, right? And it's helpful for us as teachers, as well as for the student to be able to do some goal setting, right? All the beautiful scaffolding in the world isn't going to be very effective if, in fact, the goals that the student has are different from the goals that the teacher has. So this is about being on the same page. But then we have to consider what are the different ways in which scaffolding can occur? And so we're actually gonna talk about four different ways that scaffolding happen. Front edge scaffolds are an important part of this, as well as having those distributed scaffolds that happen. Now, if you're kind of wondering, here's some terminology here, not quite sure, I hope to unpack each of those for you. Peer scaffolding is another place, another source that we can utilize for scaffolding and the all important back end scaffolds. So let's kind of take on that first one uh, in particular um, and take a look at uh, what it is that we're really talking about when we talk about all of these different scaffolds, right? Because again, I'm gonna make this connection back to what John offered earlier. Scaffolds are temporary. They're not permanent. So I want to distinguish just for a moment that there's a difference between a scaffold and an accommodation. Accommodations are often put into place at various times for students who have varying learning needs as well. And they tend to extend for a longer period of time. I'm a special educator. I know many of you are as well. And again, this idea of fading 
is also important. Some of those accommodations over time might be faded as well. But when we're talking about scaffolds, we're talking about those techniques that we use for a finite period of time. We can see them uh, going away over a relatively short period of time. And one of those techniques is to use front end scaffolds. Now, front end scaffolds are just like the term sounds, things that you do in advance of instruction. You're making sure that students are prepared to learn. John used the uh, example of teaching a student how to ride a bike or teaching a child how to ride a bike. You wouldn't simply put them on the bike and say, have at it, right? you'd be doing some front end scaffolds to all of it. Well, maybe you would, but then I assure you, you're going to have to go to urgent care with that child uh, soon afterwards as well. So you do some front end scaffolds so that they are prepared to learn. And front end scaffolds can look a number of different ways. Front end scaffolds include things like setting out that success criteria. In other words, do students have an understanding of what it is that they're going to be learning today and what it is that success looks like today? That actually contributes to that mental model, building that blueprint, uh, if you will. But there are also some other techniques that we might utilize. For example, we might be chunking a longer piece of text or chunking a more complex scientific uh, explanation that needs to be moved through or a lab, uh, for instance. In other words, breaking it into those right-sized parts. We know that chunking is a valuable way to be able to break down complex ideas into their smaller incremental parts. Some of the techniques and tips that you offered around riding a bike included things like chunking. Hey, we're gonna pay attention to how the pedals work, for example, breaking it down into those smaller pieces. An another front end scaffold might be utilizing a timeline. This is especially valuable for students as they are older and have to engage in more long-term projects, maybe a project that's going to last a week or two. And perhaps creating a timeline for them is going to be really useful. Or doing a bit of pre-highlighting or some annotating of the text. Any one of these things that help to prepare the soil, if you will, for the teaching, the instruction that happens next is a, a part of those um, front end scaffolds that are offered. But I'm going to ask this of all of you as well. And that is, and go ahead and drop this right into the chat. What are some of the hazards that could happen with over scaffolding on the front end? Thanks for getting us started. Yes, exactly. Making it, uh, it, it becomes too easy, right? You might be impacting uh, the amount of engagement or even the rigor. Some of you have noted um, that rigor may be uh, too much of a challenge. Maybe breeding some of that dependency. Hey, my teacher always annotates the text for us in advance of that. Well, maybe I'm doing that in September, but I'm not necessarily doing quite as much of that in November, right? Absolutely. So with so many things in life, everything in moderation, including moderation, everything in moderation, including those front end scaffolds. Again, I think that this can um, happen, uh, especially when a teacher is new to the content or new to teaching and isn't quite sure that they're going to be able to get it without all of these front end scaffolds, right? Part of the noticing that we all do is figuring out for ourselves, what are those front end scaffolds that maybe I used to use, but I actually don't need them quite as much, right? Knowing some things about the, um, the learning process. And what that can lead to when we do some of that over scaffolding is this idea of unproductive success. Now, many of you are familiar with unproductive failure, right? Uh, we know what that looks like. The hoodie goes up, the head goes down, right? We know what that looks like. But unproductive success is something that Mel Kapur talks about that I think gets less press. 
And I'd like to draw your attention to the right side of that column, right? Unproductive success ends up being this kind of this rote memorization, this rote learning, right? And they're completing the task, but perhaps they might be undermined in terms of understanding the purpose or understanding the relevance, right? They're putting in the time, but that's about it. And it and it can actually undermine some of their goal setting as well. When it's too easy or when it seems too easy, it can undermine that goal setting kind of experience. Success can be unproductive, and it, I'll, I'll use the analogy, it's kind of like intellectually chewing everything up for that baby bird in advance and just giving it to them in that way, right? There's no transfer of knowledge. There's no uh, there's no right size challenge or Goldilocks challenge that comes uh, with this as well. So we got to be kind of careful uh, about the front end scaffolds that we use them judiciously that we use them with the right students for the right purpose, but we're also looking to make it only as scaffolded as necessary, right? Um, Think of front end scaffolds as being a just in case technique and instead doing them and using them as a distributed scaffold, right? Just in time, rather than just in case, I'm gonna I'm gonna annotate this text because I think they're gonna need this. How about if we also make sure that some of those scaffolds might shift over in some cases to a just-in-time approach, right? If I'm seeing that they need more scaffolds, I can go ahead and pull that out. But I don't necessarily always, a hundred percent of the time, need to lead with that idea. Now, we use distributed scaffolds in ways that I consider really to be kind of at the heart of the art and science of teaching, right? How it is that you use distributed scaffolds? You use them when they get stuck. So what that requires, first of all, is that you're noticing when they've gotten stuck to the point where they don't know how to move forward. And then you pull out those distributed scaffolds, right? Because those are really critical, you might by start start by asking some of those robust questions, those questions that cause them to consider, for instance, some background knowledge. One of the things that we know is that students often temporarily forget how to utilize relatively new information in the face of a new task. So sometimes our questions alone might be enough for them to go, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And they begin to apply it. Right. But sometimes those robust questions alone aren't enough. And we may have to follow up with some prompts. Some prompts are ways in particular to get them to be able to consider what it is that they might not be seeing within that space. Cues are even more overt. Cues are when we start to say things like, take a look again at the diagram that's on page 72. And then think about my question again, right? We're actually shifting their attention. And if those kinds of scaffolds don't really work, then we go back to some direct explanation or some modeling as needed. So let's take a look about two minutes of a teacher, a ninth grade teacher in uh, in English. And she's providing some distributed scaffolds with a student who's having some difficulties, kind of gotten stuck on the informational article that he's writing about distributions of breathing problems in the United States. Let's take a listen to Kelly. What else are you noticing from the from the map that, and that you wrote about? That a lot of the East Coast is some, like specifically this part is suffering and this part is suffering from uh, re- respiratory diseases okay so let's look at your writing right here it says um, I noticed that the northern east coast are suffering from respiratory illness right you wrote that what would make your writing a little bit stronger right here what do you think how can you make your writing a little bit stronger you you use the, the map as a source 
What do you think might help here? Um, maybe describing what I think about respiratory diseases. Okay, okay. So maybe we should, should, should we'll write describe right here. Yeah. Okay. A little more detail or elaborate. You know that phrase, elaborate, right? Such as what? Well, it's going to help you um, remember to do that. Well, probably, maybe I should use any more adjectives. Okay, all right. And what I, what I, what myself think about respiratory diseases. Okay, and what do you think about respiratory diseases? What do you know I about really that? I think about possibly the use of cigarettes. Okay, okay. So perhaps we can make some notes right here. Cigarettes, um, I'm going to write my ideas. That might help you, too. And you had mentioned adjectives, too, yeah. as helpful for you to kind of elaborate in your writing okay anything else you think your writing is missing or that would make it a stronger piece um probably talking about more about stroke because most of the u.s is suffering from stroke okay i like that idea so more more about stroke and, and where what what can you add to that maybe what what causes it in okay general. Okay. And why would a lot of the U.S. be suffering from it? Okay. So causes and why are we suffering from it, most of the U.S.? Okay. And are you going to be able to get that information from this map as a source? No, you're going to, probably going to do research on my own. Great. Okay, so let's write that here so we remember that we're going to have to do um, more on that, okay? More research on your own. It's the art and science of teaching. It really is. And Lois, to your point um, uh, as well, I think that the caution always is on making sure the dependency doesn't um, uh, doesn't set in. In this particular case, he had already done some writing and he needed to move forward with that. His writing wasn't in the place that it needed to be. And so that's when the scaffolds came in, in this particular case. Back end scaffolds, not surprisingly, they happen after the learning has occurred. And the reason that I put that old TWA picture up there is because I want you to notice the steps. Back-end scaffolds are movable, just like those steps that come off of an airplane. They're there when they're needed. You move them away when they're not needed, but they come at the end, right? And uh, some of those back-end scaffolds include things like graphic organizers, right? We don't actually, we shouldn't have students filling out graphic organizers, by the way, that's called copying, um, in advance of learning something, right? The teacher's done all the thinking, but rather we do some learning and then we start to move it into those graphic organizers. Study skills is another example of those back-end kinds of scaffolds. They might be cognitive study skills, um, the, you know, things like um, teaching around summarizing and so on. They might be metacognitive, how it is that you're managing um, uh, yourself and you're doing that planning or those affective study skills around motivation and agency and so on. But these are all back-end study skills. Here's an example that we utilize with elementary students um, uh, around in the green. What are some of those study skills that are related to cognition as well as in the yellow metacognition as well as those affective kinds of behaviors as well. And another back-end scaffold is, of course, the feedback that we offer to students. And, and keeping in mind, um, in particular, that the feedback that we offer to students is um, always addressing those four Cs, that there is care to what it is that we offer, that we possess some credibility around what it is that we're offering, that we circle back around to those ideas around clarity, what's our goal, what's our target, and that we communicate that clearly so that students understand, not just us, but that students understand. We can also utilize peer scaffolds uh, as well. Uh, for example, in your classroom, teaching students from the beginning that this is a helping classroom and that all of us are responsible for being able to do these four things and asking ourselves, did I offer help to somebody today? Did I ask for help today? Did I accept help today? And did you politely decline help if you still wanted to try it? 
on your own. I'd love to be able to see in the chat, what are some of the ways that you create a classroom environment that supports that emotional scaffolding among peers? Peer help, yeah, absolutely. Having a class charter, I love that as well. A kindness wall. Penguin igloo help wall. Not quite sure what that is, but it sounds great. <laughs> so all of these ways are ways that we provide a variety of scaffolds, front end scaffolds, distributed scaffolds, peer scaffolds, and back end scaffolds. But the last idea that John and I want to lead you with is back to where it is that we started. And that is that scaffolds, because they are temporary, we plan for as a fade. And this is aligned with the gradual release of responsibility, right? You saw that in the chart at the beginning as well, that as the fading increases, students are increasing the level of cognitive responsibility that they have um, as well. And there are two ways of being able to think uh, about the fading plan. And all of us should have plans for how it is that we fade. One is least to most. And the idea around least to most is um, especially that you are starting off with the least amount of scaffolding that you need and then adding to it as you go on. So for example, starting out with those robust questions and then adding some prompts if needed, adding some cues only if they're needed, and then going back to direct explanation, again, only as it's needed. But we start with the least amount. But the other way to be able to fade is considering a most to least approach. And I'll go back to the bike, uh, sorry, the bike riding analogy again. When most of us have taught a child how to ride a bike, we use most to least in that particular case. In other words, we do a lot of direct instruction, a lot of hands-on, a lot of modeling at the beginning, right? Making sure that they have some immediate success and then gradually beginning to take away some of those supports so that the learner can begin to gain that as well. Now, caution with that in going from most to least is that you must have a fading plan in place, right? Otherwise, you risk never fading just keeping those scaffolds there forever. You have to plan for all of that as well. John, I know we've got a million ideas and unfortunately we don't have a million minutes. Um, so I, I hope that we have intrigued you with some ideas around scaffolding. I think for those of you who support fellow teachers in particular, it can be really helpful to be able to articulate what it is that scaffolding looks like. So hopefully you have met some of this success criteria, describing what some of the essential characteristics are. Um, can you explain the reciprocal relationship between students and your instructional scaffolds? And can you apply a model of scaffolds to those upcoming learning tasks? I know we're coming right down to the end of our time together. Megan, I wanna turn this over to you because you've got prizes to give away. So with that, thank you, everyone, and enjoy your morning, evening, afternoon, and the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everybody.